Chapter Five of Autumn Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Autumn Leaves, edited by Anna Wales Abbott. Aunt Molly, a reminiscence of Old Cambridge. In looking back upon my early days. One of the images that rises most vividly to my mind's eye is that of Miss Molly, or Aunt Molly, as she was called by some of her little favourites, that is to say, about a dozen girls, and, not complimentary to the unfair sex, to be sure, one boy. There was one who, even to Miss Molly, was not a torment and a plague, and I must confess he was a pleasant specimen of the genus. At the time of which I speak, the great awkward barn of a schoolhouse on the common near the Appian Way had not reared its imposing front. In its place, in the centre of a grass plot that was one of the very first to look green in spring and kept its verdure through the heats of July, stood the brown one-storied cottage which she owned and in which the aged woman lived alone. Her garden and clothes yard behind the house were fenced in, but in front the visitor to the cottage, unimpeded by gate or fence, turned up the pretty green slope directly from the street to the lowly door. As I have started for a walk into the old times, and am not bound by any rule to stick to the point, I will here digress to say that the Episcopal Church the church, as it was simply called, when all the rest were meeting-houses, that tells the traveller what a pure and true taste was once present in Cambridge, and, by the contrast it presents to the architectural blunders that abound in the place, tells also what a want of it there is now. This beautiful church stood most appropriately and tastefully surrounded by the green turf, unbroken by stiff gravel walks or coach sweep, and undivided from the public walk by a fence. Behind the church, and forming a part of its own grounds, where now exist the elegances of school court, was an unappropriated field, and that spot was considered by a certain little group of children of six or seven years old the most solitary, gloomy, mysterious place in their little world. When the colours of sunset had died out in the west, and the stillness and shadow of twilight were coming on, they used to snatch a fearful joy in seeing one of their number, whose mother had kindly omitted the first lesson usually taught to little girls, to be afraid of everything, perform the feat of going slowly around the church alone, stopping behind it to count a hundred. Her wonderful courage in actually protecting the whole group from what they called a flock of cows, and in staking and patting the mad dogs that they were forever meeting, was nothing to this going round the church. But to return to the cottage, from which the pretty rural trait of its standing in its unfenced green dooryard led me away to notice the same sort of rustic beauty where the church stood. We did not stop to knock at the outside door, for Aunt Molly was very deaf, and if we had knocked our little knuckles off she would not have heard us, but went in, and passing along the passage, rapped at the door of the common room, half sitting room, half kitchen, and were admitted. Those who saw her for the first time whether children or grown people were generally afraid of her, for her voice, unmodulated of course by the ear, was naturally harsh, strong and high-toned, and the sort of half-laugh, half-growl that she uttered when pleased might have suggested to an imaginative child the howl of a wolf. She had very large features, and sharp, penetrating black eyes shaded by long grey lashes, and surmounted by thick, bushy grey eyebrows. I think that when she was scolding the schoolboys, with those eyes fiercely glowering at them from under the shaggy grey thatch, 
she must have appeared to those who in their learned page had got as far as the furies like a living illustration of classic law her cap and the make of her dress were peculiar and suggestive of those days before and at the time of the revolution of which she loved to speak but we her little favourites were not afraid of her to go into her garden in summer and eat currants larger and sweeter than any we found at home to look up at the enormous old damson tree when it was white with blossoms and the rich honeycomb smell was diffused over the whole garden was a pleasant little excursion to us she took great care and pains to save the plums from the plundering boys because it was the only real damson there was anywhere in the neighbourhood and she found a ready sale for them for preserves she seemed to think that the real damsons went out with the real gentry of the olden time and perhaps they did as damsons though for aught i know they may figure now in our fruit catalogues as the duke of argyle's new seedling acidulated drop of damascus which would be something like a translation of damson into the modern terminology but more pleasant still was it to go into aunt molly's best room the walls she had papered herself with curious stripes and odd pieces of various shapes and patterns ornamented with a border of figures of little men and women joining hands cut from paper of all colours and they were adorned besides with several prints in shining black frames there was no carpet on the snow-white unpainted floor but various mats and rugs of all the kinds into which ingenuity has transformed woollen rags were disposed about it the bed was the pride and glory of the room however for on it was spread a silk patchwork quilt made of pieces of the brocade and damask and elegant silks of which the ladies belonging to the grand old tory families had their gowns and cardinals and other paraphernalia made aunt molly had been a mantua maker to the old quality and she could show us a piece of madame vassal's gown on that wonderful and brilliant piece of work the bed quilt on that hint she would speak aha they were real gentle folks that lived in them days aha i declare i could e'en almost kneel down and kiss the very earth they trod on as they went by my house to church polite they were yes they knew what true politeness was and to my thinking true politeness is next to saving grace once a year or so aunt molly would dress up in her best gown a black silk trimmed with real black lace and a real lace cap relics of the good old days of toryism and brocade and the real gentry and go to make an afternoon visit to one of her neighbours after the usual salutations the lady would ask her visitor to take off her bonnet and stay the afternoon knowing by the rig that such was her intention but she liked to be urged a little so she would say oh i only came out for a little walk it was so pleasant and stopped in to see how little henry did since his sickness you know i always call him my boy yes aunt molly the only boy in the universe that for you had any good in him after the proper amount of urging she would lay aside her bonnet and black satin mantle saying well i didn't come here to get my tea but you were so urgent i believe i will stay aunt molly's asides were often amusing she was so very deaf that she could not hear her own voice and often imagined she was whispering when she could be heard across the room on one occasion she saw a gentleman who was a stranger to her in the parlour when she went to visit one of the ladies who were kind and attentive to her she sat a few minutes looking keenly at him and then whispered who's that mr j who mr j who mr j 
Oh, Mr. J. Well, what does he do for a living? He's a tutor, ma'am. What? A tutor. What? A tutor. Oh, I thought you said a suitor. Aunt Molly owned the little brown cottage where her widowed mother, she said, had lived, and there she died. As soon as she was laid in her grave, it was torn down, and the precious damson tree was felled. I was rather glad that the schoolhouse was so ugly, that I might have a double reason for hating the usurper. If Nemesis cared for schoolboys, she doubtless looks on with a grin now to see them scampering at their will round the precincts of the former enemy of their race, and listens with pleasure while they make day hideous, where once the bee and the hummingbird only broke the quiet of the little garden. Aunt Molly had a vigorous, active mind and a strong, tenacious memory, and her love of the departed grandeur and Toryism of Court Row, as she called that part of Brattle Street from Ash Street to Mount Auburn, was pleasant and entertaining to those who listened to her tales of other times. Peace to her memory. End of chapter 5